So this morning, I have the honor of speaking on finance. And when it comes to finance, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit of a nerd. Uh, my wife and I are self-proclaimed gazelles. I don't know if you know what gazelle intensity is, but I like Dave Ramsey. I listen to the material, I listen to the content, and I got into that a number of years ago. About seven or eight years ago, God called me into the mission field out in uh, Mexico at the time, and then Central America, Nicaragua, different areas. And initially, to do that, I had to raise my own funds. I needed to figure out how to survive on a budget. I had to pay my own taxes, and I was just starting to adult and didn't even know where to start. TurboTax saved me. And I was <laughs> trying, trying to figure this out, and, and I was like, man. And then, and then like, it was right after the recession, and I had a lot of friends and family members who had like lost homes, lost retirements, and I was freaked out. I was like, I, I'm not even an employee. Like, nobody's showing me how to do any of this, and if I don't raise funds to go to the mission field, not only am I gonna struggle to eat, but like, I'm gonna be capped. I'm gonna be limited to do what God has called me to if I don't figure out how to figure out this thing called finance. And so I just got on Google and did what any good person would do and started doing research. And there are so many different ways that we could manage our finances. And I was a little bit lost. But my family, they had gone through their own financial struggles. And my mom gave me a book by Dave Ramsey when I was like 18. And she was like, Alex, son, she calls me son. You need to figure this out. Like if you practice this, you could be, you know, millionaire by 60, whatever. And I was like, sure, mom, you know. And, and I just set it to the side. And all of a sudden, this, came, this, this time came in my life where I, there was just something greater than myself. There was something, it was, it was a mission for God. It was this purpose. And I realized that if I don't manage my finances well, if I don't figure this out, it's going to impact my ability to go after God. And I believe that is true for all of us here. We're all missionaries. You may not be called to Mexico like I was or Cairo or Nicaragua, but you are in Fredericksburg, and Fredericksburg is our mission field. And I quoted earlier in the year when you're talking about values, this idea that either you are a missionary or a mission field. And so you have a calling, so do I. All of us have a unique purpose for the kingdom of God. And as we do this series, you know, we're gonna talk today about the obstacle of finances and how that can impact our ability to go after God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength. How the obstacle of finances could keep us from reaching our fullest potential if we don't steward and manage it well. It could cause us not to be able to reach those whom God wants us to reach. Not because God is not greater, but perhaps because we are not being intentional in this one area. And so that is the topic today, intentionality. The main theme of this message is that intentionality creates a spiritual legacy. And so this morning I want to speak on this, and we will get into some text. We're going to get into Luke a little bit later in the message. But I want to start off by sharing some facts with you about finances currently in the United States. I want to share with you all what the current financial landscape is. And then we're gonna talk about what God calls us to do with our finances and move forward. And so let me share some facts with you right now. Did you know that there is a phrase called making it rain? It's a fact. I'm a youth pastor, I work with young adults, I am a millennial, and although I've been in Central America for a number of years, I, I'll just be honest with you, I was behind the times. Like I had a flip phone in 2016. Not cool, and it wasn't because I was a hipster. Um, so, but I had a budget, and that's why. So there's this idea called make it rain, and it's all over you know, YouTube and videos and movies, and, and this whole idea is nothing new because every generation has its vices, has its pull, its temptation, this tendency to, to just make us go after money, and the idea of making it rain is literally making it rain. And I mean, like, people want big money, big houses, nice cars, and yet it's not really raining money on most people. They're drowning. It's flooded. It's flooded with debt. It's flooded with hopelessness. It's flooded with despair. It's flooded in foreclosure. It's flooded in bankruptcy. People are not really experiencing that very often. And those who do, it's like that NFL guy who he got his big paycheck and he's up there and he's making it rain. And you know what we find out years later? 
He's bankrupt because they're not managing what God's given them. They're letting it manage them. It is the focal point and they spend it going crazy because that is, maybe that's what life is about for some people and they find that they're stuck. And all of us, all of us, no one is perfect in here. I know there are people in here who genuinely are struggling right now financially. Some of it is because we've made poor decisions or we didn't manage or we weren't intentional. Some of it is because there were crises in our lives and some of it is because we just don't know what we don't know. I didn't grow up in a family where I was taught how to manage our own finances. And some of you are well off and there's nothing wrong with that. I just wanna make that clear. You know, having nice things in a nice home or a large home is not wrong. Money is not evil, it's the love of money that is evil. So check this out. In the United States right now, there is an outstanding balance of $1.2 trillion of student debt in the United States. The average debt is $33,000 for a student. The average car loan, $30,000. More than 1.4 billion credit cards are open. The average person has around $15,000 of debt. And for those of you who work in finance, I know who you are because I can see your faces. These are general statistics. They range, they change, but these are generally true, give or take thousands of dollars, a few thousand, three or four. 57% of households have no budget. 50% of Americans live, I'm sorry, have less than one month savings in their bank account. According to Pew Research, 10,000 baby boomers, those who are reaching age 65, traditional retirement age, every single day, right? Nearly half of them are gonna face their golden years with less than $10,000 saved. Two big crises is coming up, the student loan and those who wanna retire but will not be able to. 61% of Americans could not cover a $1,000 setback or emergency. Christians make up 33% of the world's population. We receive 50% three percent of the world's annual income and we spend 98 percent of it on ourselves on average the american church members i know some of us tithe some of us give some of us don't give at all but if you look at everybody as a whole american church members when you combine the people that are giving the average is 2.58 percent of their income that's how much is given 25 percent of those in church give nothing at all and during the great depression giving was actually higher, 3.3%. Our financial landscape does not look anything like we're seeing in social media, in the movies, and the influences in our lives. So many people are struggling. The struggle is real, not just for millennials who are trying to figure out how to adult, but also for the baby boomers who want to retire like their parents did. It's everyone. And this does impact us. And we need to consider, what does this mean for us? How does this impact my ability to go after God? What does it mean for the church? Will this impact my ability to give everything that I have for the kingdom and do all that God has called me to? The consequences are huge and it does impact the church. You know, when you look at the church landscape, let's just say churches as a whole across the United States right now. 5,000 to 10,000 churches in the United States are dying each year, closing their doors. Around 100 to 200 churches closed last week. That's what the statistics say. Now, I'm a pastor and I can tell you that there's more than just finances that impact the state of the church across the United States. Some churches don't wanna do what it takes to keep up with their culture and make the gospel relevant. I'm not talking about compromising the gospel. I'm talking about getting out there and reaching people, making it real. But at the end of the day, I know plenty of other churches who are talking about closing the doors because they cannot pay their bills. And so this does impact the church. This does impact our ability to send out missionaries. This does impact our ability to go out and do outreach and do things like our motel ministry or going to El Salvador and planting a church there or the church that we planted in Africa. If churches are dying, they're not sending missionaries. It's an issue. And yet, someone much smarter than I, they did the work to see what would happen if everybody in the church gave their tithe. If they gave 10%, what would happen? They said there'd be a surplus of $165 billion. And when you break it down, 
some amazing things could happen. 25 billion could relieve global hunger, could stop starvation and deaths from preventable diseases within five years. 12 billion could eliminate illiteracy. 15 billion could solve the issue of having unclean water and poor sanitation. One billion could fully fund all overseas missions work across the world. Yes, again, factors. You know, we'd have to be good stewards and allocate those sources. But we could do amazing things as a church, the whole church, all churches combined, if everybody was able to give financially. And yet there are real walls in our lives that are keeping us from being able to do that. And this morning we'll talk about some of those obstacles. But if everybody was able to, it would be awesome. It would be amazing. So the first area that I want to talk about this morning is the idea, it's not even an idea, the, 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 the principle, the truth that we're called to be good stewards of what has been given to us financially. All of us in here. All of us have been called to steward what God has given us financially. And the Bible gives us some great steps. It's not like a Dave Ramsey book where it outlines everything one, two, three. And that's, by the way, a philosophy, not gospel. But the Bible does have a ton of verses. In fact, Pastor Dale shared recently, you know, when you just look at different keywords alone, you know, over 500 in faith, but over 2,000 regarding finances. So the Bible is full of truth and principles and wisdom regarding finances, and we need to look and discover what can we take away from this? What can we apply to our lives? How can we rid ourselves of the obstacles that are keeping us from giving, but more importantly, keeping us from being the missionaries that God has called us to be? keeping us from our call that God has given to us. John Wesley, a great man of God who was also not perfect, but he reached a number of people across the United States, did some amazing work. He said, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Now, scripture does not state financial steps, so frankly. But I, I like the tension of that. Because when we do read scripture and if we study topically, we are, I believe, gonna see those different concepts outlined. And I wanna break that down a little bit for us today. And the first is that we as believers are called to work hard. We're called to be light and wherever we are, being light is not being a missionary. If you are a believer, you are light. Being a missionary, going after your calling is being intentional with where are you bringing your light. But when I think about this, and, and I'll be honest right now, like in Fredericksburg, I think there are very few people who are not working hard. Many people here that I know, you do work hard. You are tired because you wake up early and you get home late and you spend more of your time on 95 than you do or you would like to because you'd like to be with your family or in ministry. And so I know that this is an area that maybe few here need to be exhorted in, but know that this is also what the Bible teaches and instructs us, and so all of us can at least examine our own lives and say, is there an area in my life where God has called me to, and it's everything, do everything unto him. That's what scripture calls us to. It says, do all the work, do everything that he's given us, do it unto the Lord. You know, Paul actually said, listen, he who doesn't work, don't give him food to eat. That's, that's, that's harsh words, right? But I think Christ knows that we're not called to enable people. Enabling people doesn't truly help them. People have to wanna change. And that's why if I give these steps today on finances, if we don't really wanna change, it's just information. It's like churches across the United States right now who've been listening to the Bible for 30 years and saying, why don't we see revival? And it's because they're not practicing what they've been taught. The following point in being good stewards is that we have to be wise. In Proverbs, it says that a wise man's house in it are treasures and there are, cho there are stores of choice food. Okay, attention. We can have nice things. We can have a nice house. We can have nice cars. But it's not because life is about making it rain money. The Bible is very clear that greed and covetousness are not of God. Money is not supposed to be our idol. It's not supposed to be our God. But we can be wise. 
We're called to be wise. We're called to be prudent. It says that the prudent sees danger and hides himself from it. It says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But there are obstacles, again, to this being wise, to saving. Saving is a good thing. It's not being greedy. Saving allows us to go all in after God. It allows us to be generous. It allows us to be free. Some obstacles, like you see behind me and in our lives, could be ignorance or comparison. It could be storing up treasures because we have overvalued money or overvalued things. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil. And so when we put money above God, and that is what we're gonna talk about today, that's when we get off course. Obstacles like debt. We have bought into the cultural lie that it is the norm. That's right. Obstacles like worthless pursuits. Some of us are more intentional about finding something on Netflix than we are about finding someone to invest in and disciple. Obstacles like not learning from others. And let me just tell you as a younger person, you know, when I went into that season, I, I said, I, I looked for people with gray hair who were somewhere where I wanted to be financially. And I said, how did you get there? I, I literally asked, it was humbling. It was kind of, I was like, it's like, I don't know if I'm like asking too much, but I wanted to know. I, had, I have friends who are retired. And I'm like, how did you get there? Because I see these people, it's not working for them. And I, I want to know how to do this. I want, I, want, I want to be in ministry when I'm 60. I don't want to retire from ministry. Amen. And I wanted to learn from others. And so I would say, those of you who are younger, you need, to, you need to look for people who are steps ahead of you spiritually or financially or emotionally or physically, wherever it is that you feel like you're called to grow right now. And, and you need to ask for advice. You need to get into books. And those of you who are older, please don't step back. Don't retire from ministry. You can retire from your day job, but listen, now that you don't have your day job, would you please go all in and say, I wanna raise up our students. I wanna raise up our young adults. It's so important. It's needed. I see it all the time. Please adult and please help the person behind you. <laughs> so, Proverbs, I wanna talk about debt because I think this is one of the most under-talked issues in church. It's very easy for us to talk about giving because it would immediately change what we could do as a church, but I know across the United States, one of the obstacles that keeps people from giving is because they are so behind in their finances. And not for everyone. There are legitimate obstacles, things that have happened, crises, health emergencies that people have needed to use debt for. But I also know when we look at the statistics that many are just embracing debt. That many are living above their means, not below. Perhaps that means that cash is king in their life. And the Bible is very clear that we are not called to embrace debt. It also does not say debt is a sin. So don't hear me wrong. I don't want you to feel shame or guilt or condemnation about this. But again, there is this cultural lie out there right now that it is the norm. And Paul, he actually says it's not. He says, listen, don't owe anyone anything other than love. So many people are missing their opportunities because debt is a wall in their life keeping them from going after God. Paul said, listen, contentment with godliness is great gain. It's gonna take some work. It's gonna take some intentionality, but it's gonna be worth it. Proverbs says that when we borrow money, we are enslaved to the lender and we are called to run from it. Don't make that the norm, church. Don't embrace debt. Jesus came to give us freedom. Why would we make ourselves in bondage to anything? Another area of wisdom that I think is just practical and again, I, my, my goal right now is just, I wanna see all of us go after God's call in our lives. I wanna see all of us reach your fullest potential is making a budget so that you can do so. It's being organized. God is a God of order. If you read through Leviticus, he has a lot of ways of managing what he had given to Israel so that they could achieve what he asked them to do. And there's nothing wrong. It's not being greedy if we take our money and we say, God, this is what you've given me. How do I allocate it wisely? And if I'm practical, again, 
the prudent sees danger and hides from it. Did you hear the statistics that I shared earlier? There are some grave issues economically across our country, and I know our economy is strong, but we should be concerned. Whether you are a believer or not, we should be concerned because statistically speaking, half of the people in here were in a mess financially. We all just saw Florence come through, right? Okay, so I don't want you to raise your hands on this, but think if you were to raise your hand, how many of us had to go to the grocery store because Florence came? How many of us saw the news, we panicked, we saw the social media, we panicked, and we, and we were like, I gotta go get water bottles, I gotta go get toilet paper. I don't wanna be without toilet paper. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, people put their lives at risk because they weren't prepared. They're driving out in the middle of the storm, in the middle of everybody else going out there, Things are running out, their family is at risk and that's why now they're going out even though when they shouldn't be because they don't want their family to be without but it's because they weren't prepared and if I was to ask you, now I want everyone's hands to raise if you believe this, how many of you believe there will be another hurricane? What will you do about it? Will you be, again, one of the people who runs to Target or Walmart or Publix and you have to prepare or will you just face the fact, like the statistics we read, that there will be hurricanes and we could actually set ourselves up for success. We could be a step ahead, we really could, but it requires sitting down and considering, what, what do I need in my home to protect me from these? And, I, and again, don't let that be greater in your life, but taking three hours or a day to do some research and figure out how could I survive this and not have to panic every time a storm comes, it's worthwhile. And it would actually release some of the anxiety in our life and maybe we'd feel a little bit more emotionally caught up to pour into somebody else who's freaking out. It's a nice feeling, by the way. Not freaking out, but getting help someone else who's freaking out. <laughs> it's even better when they stop freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> But 57% don't have budgets. So today, I just wanna encourage you, make a budget. It's a godly thing to do, it's a good thing to do. It's a, it's a matter of being orderly. It's, it, again, this is not a sin issue, I just wanna clarify, but this will set you up to go after God with everything you have, it'll help you. Another area in wisdom is get counsel, learn from others. I, I shared on that briefly, Proverbs says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. We see that throughout scripture. It's so important to learn from others. And I wanna encourage you, please, take that step to learn. We're going to do a Financial Peace University class at our church. And whether you are well off or whether you are struggling right now, maybe the money is raining, Maybe you are drowning. This class would help you wherever you are at. We want everyone in that class to be worth it. Like create a problem, please. Create a problem for us. I wanna see so many people wanting in this class to change their financial future that we have to figure out how to add a class. I would love that problem. And I'll complain about it later, but like seriously, please. Because when I look at the statistics, we need that. We need that kind of urgency in our lives. I don't want people held back financially. I wanna see all of us in here running with everything we have, not hindered by anything, so that we can do what God has called us to. We can accomplish the works he's called us to. You're unique, you have a purpose, all of us. Don't let finances be the wall that keeps us from what God has called us to. I'm intense about these topics because I've experienced financial struggle in my life. <laughs> I mean, like, I have eaten beans and rice. My wife has been gracious with me, and I've said, like, can we eat beans and rice so we can save money? And she's like, Alex, if I have to eat beans one more time. <laughs> but she's been willing to do it, and I love her. Not because of that. I loved her anyway, but it makes me love her all the more. <laughs> and in this effort, because, like I said, in my younger 20s, I'm like, I, I've got to figure this out. I don't want to be hindered financially from what God has called me to, and I want to be able to give extraordinarily because he's called me to that too, and I was struggling with it. I said, you know, Brittany, 
We just got married. We're gonna travel across the United States. We don't even have a home. Our first home was a camper, okay? And it wasn't a nice camper because I was penny pinching. I was like, hey, if we save here, babe, we'll go on vacation here. And so we got a camper. It was dry rotted. That was our first place. Then we went to Guatemala. We came back. We're driving down the road. And all of a sudden I hear, whoosh. And we both look at each other and the roof flew off like a kite. (laughs) If you ever have a pop-up camper, you, you know, I just encourage you to ratchet strap that thing (laughs) but I like I bought another dry rotted camper because I was like hey when you look at the depreciation rate of the campers why would we invest six thousand dollars in the camper we get one for a thousand dollars it's a storage unit (laughs) my dad died when I was nine years old my mom was left a widow I was nine, my sister is probably 15, 16, another sister away at YWAM. Um, it's like a college, but ministry focused, and discipleship program. She received a, a small amount of money to live off of from the insurance settlement, thank God. And, you know, here is a person who was not taught how to manage finances. She didn't even know what to tell me, other than the fact that she did teach me how to tithe. And I'm so thankful for that. I've tied ever since I was like this tall and it has not been a struggle because I was taught when I was young. And I, I, I do have empathy for those who weren't taught how to tithe because it's a huge leap going from 100 to 90. I get it. But we received that and she went to an advisor. She brought him the money. She was hoping that this would be used to help take care of her and her family. And she started to get all these statements and she did not know how to read them. She saw that they were losing money he, you know, the advisor wouldn't tell her, you know, what was happening. She didn't know how to compare, you know, investments to one another, or what was happening. And a year later, she lost half of the money that she received to live off of because the advisor was making trades without her permission and they were trades that were just stupid. There are stupid investments out there. And thankfully, this company... They received a letter from my mom and they had empathy and they were like, there's no way we can let it out that a widow just lost half of her money she invested with us. And they reimbursed her those funds. But there's a couple morals to that story. One is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. I don't blame her for that. She did her best. She thought she could trust someone. But we cannot assume, it's too great a risk, that some advisor, because they have a, a, a degree behind their name, has their best interest for us. I'm sorry if you are an advisor, but if you're a great advisor, you're gonna amen to that. Just because someone has a degree doesn't mean that they have our best interest for us. We owe it to ourselves to be financially informed. We owe it to ourselves to be highly intentional with every area of our life and to be able to say, hey, what you're saying makes sense. I do wanna entrust this to you. Please, manage it. What if, what, if, what if we didn't get that money back? How would that have impacted me as a child? We might have been living in a camper when I was 16. And some of us live in campers here today. And we need help financially. And so, I believe that doing this class, Financial Peace University, October 10th, it's gonna be Wednesday nights at seven o'clock, that's the first one we're gonna start that this will help many people make better decisions financially. It'll help the single mothers. It'll help those who want to figure out how to adult. It'll help those who are in their 50s and 60s and wanted to figure out how to retire in five years. Please join this class if you don't have a budget, or even if you do, if you want to know more, let's do this together so we can accomplish God's will for our lives. The third area is being generous. God calls us to be extraordinarily generous as believers. In Luke chapter six, verse 38, it said, give and it'll be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and put into your lap. For the measure you use will be measured back to you. We've been talking about generosity over the last weeks, and I don't feel like I need to go in great depth on different verses that mention this because I just believe that we already know. You can't separate this idea of being generous from a true believer. It is an adjective, a true one, of a believer. If we are gonna follow Jesus, we're gonna be generous just like him. He gave his life so that we could have life. He's extraordinarily generous, and so ought we to be. Amen. 
but sometimes there are obstacles to being generous. Sometimes it is lack of surrender. Sometimes it is not appreciating how much Jesus really gave for us. Maybe it is trusting God. Maybe that is the wall that's keeping us from obeying this area of our life. Maybe it's just not being financially informed and we have a very great outlet for that. It's the sign-up sheet in the South Warrior. But God doesn't just call us to give. He calls us to do it cheerfully. Like this is an opportunity to invest. How many of you guys like making money? Yeah. Well, I guess that's why not everybody's gonna retire. <laughs> no, but really, like I, I like to make money. It feels good, it's nice. I, I, I really like to be rewarded for my time. I like to see an investment. And I love giving because I'm making an investment in the kingdom. I give in things that I believe in. I love seeing people get to hear the gospel for the first time and when I give, I know that I'm a part of that. God sees what I've sown and you know what? It says that he will bless those who bless abundantly and I've seen that in my own life too. And I don't have this all figured out. I just want you to know that, that my own wife and I have our own struggles financially and our own goals that we're trying to meet. But I have invested time to say, God, how do you want me to manage what you've given me? How do I be a good steward so that I can do all that you've called me to do? And I believe these things are true and I've seen them at work in my life. But we're not just called to give, we're called to give cheerfully. And I think this is so important. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. This is Paul speaking to the church. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I just asked about the investment thing because I, I just hope that we all know what we're giving towards. Why wouldn't we give cheerfully if we knew that we were giving to pour out hope in other people's lives? That's an exciting thing, but I believe that there are true obstacles, there are walls that make it more difficult from being able to give cheerfully and I think about on a Sunday morning, how do we react to the bucket? I don't, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever had like an awkward bucket moment? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> like the people come and you're like, oh my gosh, the connections person, are they looking at me? Like, you know, and it's like, okay, all right. But like, <laughs> I, I want us to, like, like every giving moment, it's important. It's a reflection of our heart to God. And God says, uh, it, through Paul, he, Paul wrote, he said, listen, don't, don't do it reluctantly. Don't do it out of compulsion. Don't, don't give anymore, please, church. This is crazy, but please don't give on a Sunday morning if you're not doing cheerfully. God, God doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. And then he's asked us to be good stewards so that we can be about his kingdom, about his business. I personally, I, I don't give very often in the bucket anymore. And I had an awkward moment one time. I was like, oh man, what do people think? You know, like, but this is what works for me. I, I sit down beginning of every month and I make a budget. I, I set aside for what I'm called to give in taxes. I set aside for what is God's. I set aside for what we're gonna live off of and our bills and our costs. And I set aside for what I hope to save. And that right there has enabled me to give more cheerfully. And so I would say, if you're not giving cheerfully, it may be because we're not stewarding well what he's already given us. And if you would go and if we'd go and just steward it well, it's so much more joyful to give when we know that we're doing what he's called us to or being faithful with what he's given us. It's exciting. It's really fun. I love it. But I've given out of my poverty. You know, I've actually, someone recently said, you know, did you teach tithing when you were in Central America? And we did. I worked in communities that had dirt floors, no running water, they went to the woods to go to the bathroom, 2018, um, maybe a light bulb. I mean, the, the, these were people in poverty by our definition. But when you go into this community and you're with them and you will actually see that everybody has dirt floors, we're in a, we're a different world over here, but then there's a whole nother layer of poverty in their community. And those people, while we'd see them poor in our eyes, some of them were really well off. They had a lot of mango trees. And they were still able to give. And I believe that's true for us. We are able to give, all of us. I believe that, I, I, I do believe in tithing. And I, I would just say though in this idea of giving cheerfully, just please spend time with God and ask him what you ought to be giving now. 
Make one step closer in the direction that you know God is calling you to obey giving in. It's gonna be worth it. It really is. I, I, I believe in this with all my heart. My wife and I, we have been impacted by seeing how God moves in our life. And so I just encourage you to be intentional about giving. It'd be better to give one time a month with intentionality than to give every single time out of your pocket whatever is there. I, I think that it would mean more to God that you spend time and you asked him what you ought to be giving regularly. And it's not even just finances that I'm speaking about today. It's just everything in our lives. It's our time, it's our calendar, it's our skills, it's our resources. That intentionality is what produces a spiritual legacy. Brittany and I, when we moved to Nicaragua, we were faced with the need. There's just all this need in these communities. And as missionaries, you ride this line of you don't want to just meet every need because you don't want to be the reason like that, that not, you don't want gifts to be the reason they're coming. You want it to be about the giver, right? And, and we were struggling with this, like, like do we give when they ask? Because we can, we can meet their needs, but should we? And we didn't feel like we were supposed to just meet every need, but we, we were wrestling with this idea of, and I, I really love going through the book of the Bible like verse by verse, and we were teaching through Matthew, and I'm getting ready to teach when Jesus just says, give to those who ask of you, and I was like, oh, like, they just asked me for shoes. Like, how, do, how what, what is my response gonna be? Am I being duplicitous? What do I do, or do I reason it out of like, and, and I just said, you know what, Brittany, what if we, what if we just gave every single time somebody asked of us? Unless we truly thought it was gonna be for something harmful, you know, like, like, like an addiction or something. What if we just went with the benefit of the doubt the majority of the time and we gave and we gave what we could? Because I don't always have enough money in my pocket for shoes, but I might have $5 or I might have something. And so we tried that for an entire month. We gave every single time something, not all of it, towards a need that was asked of us and we did it cheerfully, but it was a hard month for us financially. We were struggling. We were trying to figure out how do we raise our support? How do we meet our goals? We were in that beans and rice phase of life. The month that we did that, our support practically doubled. We had the strongest month of support that we'd had in almost a year. Brittany and I, we were at a conference. We got invited to a Heidi Baker conference in Austin, Texas by these crazy people, and they put us in the front row. <laughs> and... <laughs> We met some people behind us and you know, we, we, we talked, we had a fun time and at the end they had like a love offering. And, and, um, and again, I, you know, I, I really, you know, I'm trying to practice this whole not giving out of compulsion or reluctantly, but giving with joy. And you know, we, were, we were going to Guatemala, it was crazy, the, tri- the story, but we were going to Guatemala the next day. And again, tied on cash. And I said, well, let's, let's give $100 at $200 with me. And I was like, let's, let's give $100. And I um, went up there, dropped it off. I came back, and I felt like God was telling me to give the rest of the money. And I was like, oh. you know, I'm freaking out. I'm like fighting God on this. You ever notice, like, when you freak out, you fight God, it feels like it was 10 minutes, but it was like, you know, five seconds? <laughs> now it would have felt crazy if you no one ever said that, yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, and, and, I, and I was like, Brittany, I, I think we need to take this step. We need to do this. And she just was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, that, the weight of like my wife and, you know, I want to provide for her. I want to be wise, but I really felt it was God. And so I went up there, I dropped off the, hundred other, the other $100. When we went back to our friend's house that evening, I, like, again, this is, I mean, you hear these stories, but it's, it's true. Like I put my hand in my pocket and there was $200 in my, in the, in the jacket pocket. The reward honestly was not getting our money back. The reward was obedience is being faithful to what God put on our heart and, and seeing that we can trust him. It's worth it. We're called not just to steward our finances, but to leverage all of our resources for the kingdom. It's, this is bigger than our money. It really is. This is more, impo- more important, all this, than, than just finances. I don't want to see anyone limited by their finances, but... I know that that really is an obstacle, and so I hope that those steps that I gave all of us here today can help us take one more step closer to being free financially so we can go after God with all our heart. There's the course, sign up. But it's not just about money. It really isn't. Money is just a tool. It's about everything God's given us and being intentional with it. Let's read Luke 19, 11 through 27. Luke 19, 
11 through 27. I'm gonna start in verse 12. A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minus and said to them, engage in business until I come. I'm gonna try this out. What did he say? Engage in business. Engage in what? Okay, thank you. That was awesome. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Okay, so who did he ask to return? I kind of like jumped through that really quick. His citizens hated him. When he came back, he asked who to return? His servants. And what was the purpose for bringing them back? To see what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minus more. And he said to him, well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came saying, Lord, your mina has, has made five minus. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him, give it to the one who has 10 minus. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minus. I tell you that to everyone, tell that to everyone who has, more will be given, but the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. I know this is not the WPER version of Jesus. I can't not read that parable, this is Jesus' words, and it not stir something in me. It's truth. And truth should cause something to happen inside of us when we read it. This is too big to miss. Our time here in Fredericksburg, wherever God calls you, is not just about making money. It's not even just about stewarding money. It's about using everything we have, leveraging it for the kingdom. When we read that passage that Jesus is sharing, he's sharing essentially what is present, what would happen, and what will happen. Jesus in this story is the nobleman. The people who hated him are Israel. They sent him to die. We know that he rose again. And then we are the servants in this story. The question that we have to ask ourselves this morning though, is which type of servant are we? And as I noted, you know, they sent the servants to do his business while he was gone. This is that time. This is that time in our lives right now. Jesus, he's ready to come back. He is coming back. He is alive. We have something to do, church. We have business to do, church. We have kingdom to bring, church. There are people in Fredericksburg who are lost, who are hopeless. There are people who need to hear about the love of God. Jesus told his disciples, we're those servants, church. He said, go make disciples. That is the business that we have been left. That is what we've been called to. That's what all this is about. All of this money, it's for the purpose of making disciples. Would you just be that steward who is shrewd and use whatever he's given you to be about the business of God? I sit with that. I, I think about where am I spending my time? What am I investing in? Not everything that is good is God. Sometimes we keep people from rising up in ministry because we're not willing to be challenged in the next phase. We've gotta be highly intentional with what God has given us. And when we look at the servant, look at the three. There was the one, he multiplied what was given to him a minus. It's about three months wages. Triple what you make right now. And in this parable, there's a different parable similar to it. They were all given one, equal amounts. And this first servant, he, tri he, he multiplied by 10. And then, and then Jesus said, listen, I'm gonna give you authority over 10 cities. The next servant, multiplied by five. Jesus says five servants. The last servant, nothing. He didn't even try. 
put it in a handkerchief and he hid it and he had two excuses. He was afraid and the master made profit from leveraging his influence and power, so why should he try anyway? And when we read text, we always need to look for ourselves in it and examine our hearts. And I think this is where we have to ask ourselves, are we giving everything we have, our finances, our calendar, our time, our family, our resources, our skills, our abilities for the kingdom? Are we doing it half-hearted? And we're gonna have five when we really could have 10? Are we halting it and delaying it because we wanna see this accomplishment in our life first? Or are we the servant who's not really making any effort at all in examining their life and what they could do with what's been given to them for the kingdom? And when he stood before Jesus, we very quickly see he wasn't a true servant. What emotions are influencing and driving our call to serve God? Is it fear? Is it complacency? Is it excitement? Do we see it as an opportunity? You know, his other response, his other excuse, I think Pastor Dale hit on it the other Sunday with the widow. This widow who gave, she impacted Jesus. Did she give a ton of money? She gave very little, but it was everything she had. And Pastor Dale said, what, what if she hadn't given? Because you looked at everybody else who had money to give. They had more to give than she had. That may be us here today. There are certainly people who are well off probably the more than all of us, right? Maybe they have better communication skills, more money to give, more time to give, or whatever it is that we feel like we lack. And we could make the excuse that we don't actually need to give the little that we have because it won't make a difference. And yet that widow, she gave the change and it impacted the heart of God. It doesn't matter how much you have. It matters what are we doing with what's been given to us. God sees our effort. He sees our intentionality. And I believe in the grace of God. We don't compromise the word of God. I'm not gonna water down this text for you. It's intense. But I believe in the grace of God that if we are just willing to make an effort that we would be that servant, just a little effort, putting his money in the bank with interest. But if you were willing to go all out, you could be the servant going after 10. And it's not because we're perfect. None of us in here are. It's because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Bible says in John, it says, listen, he prunes us. He helps us bear more fruit. It's a matter of the heart. And if we're willing to give God what we have, if we're willing to say, God, this is what I have, like that young boy with the loaf and the fishes, he can do so much more with it. Are we the servant who is multiplying? Or are we the servant who's sitting back, afraid of trying, afraid of failure? Or are we letting other people take on more because we feel like they have more to offer? When really it's not about us, it's about God. You have people in your life that only you will be able to reach. I wanna be the servant that Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. Have you thought about, I mean, again, this is, this is it's not lighthearted stuff, and, and, but we, we all, the Bible is very clear, we're gonna stand before God. We're gonna stand before Jesus. It says that he's gonna, that we're gonna be judged by him. Your name may be in the book of life, but then we're still gonna stand before him, and we have to show what we've worked so hard for. Did we work so hard to make a lot of money and make that the greatest thing in our lives? Did we work so hard to have leave an inheritance for our kids but we don't have a spiritual inheritance? Did we work so hard to have an awesome following online? What is it? What is greater in our life? Is it Jesus or is it something else? Church, I wanna hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. How many of you wanna hear that in your own life? Intentionality without Jesus as the guiding priority may be worldly success, but it never creates a spiritual legacy. You could be highly intentional, and I believe you will be highly successful. 
I think that intentionality is a very key trait of people who do well at whatever it is they put their heart into. But if Jesus, if he is not the greatest in our life, if he is not Lord of our life, then that intentionality can be taking us in the wrong direction altogether. And it may look like success, but it's not significance like we've learned about. Are we making heaven take notice with what's been given to us? To do so, Jesus has to be Lord of our lives. He has to be first. Look at Matthew, if you have your Bibles, chapter six, verse 33. but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Church, I know that there are walls in our lives. There are obstacles that are keeping us from doing what God has called us to or meeting our own personal goals or the desires of our hearts. But Jesus doesn't lie. He said, listen, the things that you need, they're gonna be added to you we've got to be willing to make Jesus first. And if you put the kingdom first, God's going to provide for you. That's the first question we have to ask if we're in trouble. Is Jesus first in my life? Was he first in my life over these years where I was making these decisions? What would it look like for us to put the kingdom first right now? We're gonna get ready to go into a song of worship and I just want us to begin to ask God right now, are we being intentional with what he's given us? Are we being intentional with the time that we have before we stand in front of him? Are we being intentional about making disciples? Are we being intentional with everything that we have, our finances, our calendar, our skills? We could do so much We've already impacted people throughout the city. People are experiencing freedom here on Sundays. And I believe this is just the tip of the iceberg, church. You know, when I look at intentionality, I think about Moses. Moses was so intentional about seeking God. And then I think about David, a phenomenal leader, but he was intentional about leading with God's heart. And I think about Jesus. He was so intentional about who he invested in. And I think about Paul, He didn't just happenstance do missional effort. He was so intentional about where he was planting churches and who he was pouring himself into. And I believe today that we would just take our time and we would ask God two questions. The first is the most important, and that is, Jesus, are you Lord of my life? Are you greater than anything else? Because if we bring in intentionality with that first, without that first component, it's just, it's just gonna shipwreck us. We're gonna be derailed. It's like building without having built the foundation first. You can have a beautiful stick-framed house with a nice roof and everything, but if that foundation isn't there, it's not gonna last. I want a spiritual legacy. I wanna use this cash, this time, the calendar, everything that God's given us, church, my communication, the people at your work, You all have something to offer the kingdom. It's not too little.